Uh, I'm Richard Reeves. Uh, I am a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution and a member of the HCEO network. I work mostly on issues of intergenerational mobility and inequality, and I've just published a book which is about a particular element of that, which is lack of mobility at the top of the distribution. So I now study class in the US, to some extent by comparison to the UK, where I, where I come from. Um, where, where, so I'm now a US and a UK citizen, and the, the book I've just written, Dream Hoarders, contrasts the US slightly with the UK, and I argue that the US has a ruthlessly efficient class reproduction machine, which actually results in less mobility, especially at the top in the US than in the UK. And there are various reasons for that, including opportunity hoarding by those of us who are at the top, by the top here, I'm broadly talking about the top 20%, 15 or 20%, not just the top 1%, but a, broad, a broader swathe of uh, U.S. society, who I think have been the winners of the inequality trends recently. But because there's a sort of sense of classlessness, uh, the myth of meritocracy in the U.S., it makes that a harder conversation to have here in some ways. My main approach when studying intergenerational mobility is to use relative position rather than, say, absolute mobility. And so a lot of people are working on are people better off than their parents were at the same age? That's absolute mobility. And that's a product, crudely put, of growth and then the distribution of the proceeds of growth. And so the U.S. had very high absolute mobility in the post-war years because you had 4% growth for 25 years, almost. Um, whereas relative mobility is necessarily a zero-sum game. It's necessarily the case that what goes up must come down. There's only, you can only fit a fifth of the distribution into the top 20% and the bottom 20% and everyone in between them. And I think it becomes, that's my sort of sense of a fair society is quite a fluid one, quite an open one. Now, that is not to say that it's not important that we also get better off and that growth doesn't matter. But uh, I think it's an important distinction between those who believe that the most important challenge facing us is to grow faster and share the proceeds of that growth. And myself and other scholars who actually think that a bigger challenge is to try and loosen the connection between where you are, relatively speaking, when you're born and where you are when you, when you uh, are grown up, when you're an adult yourself. And so I think that's quite a big difference within the debate about mobility, and it's not trivial in terms of its potential policy implications. You'd actually end up pursuing a different policy agenda if you're more interested in absolute than in relative mobility. And the other big difference, of course, is I've mentioned it's zero sum. And so it's a necessary part of the story of relative mobility that you have downward mobility as well as upward mobility. And that's a much more difficult question to tr grapple with, not just empirically, but, but normatively as well. It's a very unpopular idea, um, but it's a necessary part of the relative story. So I think those are two of the ways in which I try and make a distinct contribution. I think scholars don't often reflect enough on like, the autobiographical nature of their work. It's not a coincidence that people end up working on what they work on. And I've always been interested in this issue of intergenerational relative mobility. And so I think that for whatever reason, I think my, both my mother and father were quite upwardly mobile. I was raised in quite sort of egalitarian, sort of anti-class household. And so, but also quite a ambitious household. You know, they'd both done well. And so for me, I think that I've always had this sense that fairness lies not in the gap so much between rich and poor, but in the opportunities there are to swap places and the extent to which birth is destiny. And that's always motivated the work I've done in the UK and UK government before I moved here uh, and now here too. And I think that you know, I can now, I've, I've now done enough philosophy that I can wrap a philosophical framework around that intuition. But if I'm being honest, I think the intuition preceded the philosophy. But I now have a moral philosophy which is egalitarian in the sense of being about trying to level the playing field rather than about straightforward redistribution. So who knows exactly where it comes from, but that's the best I can do. I think by way of background, I should say that I think that the market, the labor market, mostly acts fairly meritocratically, if we define merit quite narrowly and just in terms of skills and human capital. The inequality is in the preparation for the market competition. It's really in the gaps that we see in human capital accumulation and formation in the first quarter century of life. By the age of 25, there are just these huge differences in the preparedness for the market competition. And so in a sense, it's like, I, I say in the book that, that the U.S. has a meritocratic market but an unfair society. And what I mean by that is that you see this kind of, the, the market sorts, but in a sense it's too late by the time people get to the market. And so the policy implications for me are that from birth and even kind of pre-birth in terms of access to contraception through early years home visiting, more investment in, a, in early years education, of course, which is a, something that's dear to the, H, the HCEO heart, K-12 reform, long 
long stated, um, and also I think increasingly reform of post-secondary education and the way it's funded and the way it's incentivized, the very complexity of the system and how hard it is to navigate, through to access to the labor market through things like internships. And so, you know, crudely put, what I want to see is a really significant redistribution of human capital formation opportunities in order that the market races run more fairly. And so the left don't like, the political left don't like the first half of my argument, which is essentially pro-market, but a lot of people on the right don't like the second half of my argument, which is we're going to need some really radical moves here to try and level the playing field. And so to the extent that I'm, I appear to be upsetting people in a bipartisan way, I feel reasonably comfortable that I must be somewhere in the middle.